I'm not much of a storyteller, but I have been blessed and privileged with the responsibility of listening to some of the most magnificent and eloquent excuses from some of the most prolific storytellers of our time, <laughs> whose most common and obvious trait was that they were all between the ages of 14 and 18. I only wish that I had an ounce of their creative genius, but I don't. I'm a regular, average, everyday kind of teacher. Perhaps it would help if I had a unique story to tell, but I don't. My story is no different than most teachers out there today. I have taught for about 25 years, yet every year I feel like a new teacher. I still make mistakes. I still get nervous on the first day of school and at open house. I'm just as anxious today as I was as a first year teacher making that difficult phone call home to a parent. I'm a parent myself. I've been doing this for a long time, so why am I still nervous? My son just graduated from the University of Washington. My daughter is a junior here. They both expressed an interest in teaching. But my husband and I, he's also a teacher in Shoreline, have tried to steer them away from teaching because of all the concerns of the challenges that we've seen over the years. It's not the same profession that we started in years ago. Our curriculum, state standards, and graduation requirements are constantly changing, and it's all I can do to remember the terms. First it was Wassel, then it was the HISBE, now it's Smart and Balanced. I've actually had conversations where I said, at our PLC, we need to get the data to send to the SIP, or the, send to the BLT, uh, then I'm gonna run to an SST because a student might need an IEP. We have formative assessments, common assessments, springboard, college board, common core, core 24. We have to be experts in technology with class websites, flipped classrooms, online grades, Google Classroom, I can't do it all. No two school years are alike, no two classes are alike. My most common recurring notes in my lesson plans are, next time, try this. We were asked to share our stories tonight and were given a few guiding questions. One of those was, when did I learn I was a good teacher? Well, I still haven't learned the answer to that question, and I question myself every day. Is it enough? What could I be doing differently? How can I reach these students, motivate them, challenge them? I should be doing more. Another question I wanted us to answer was, did you ever think about quitting? Every day, I doubt myself and I want to quit because I don't think I'm doing enough. I work in Shoreline, an incredibly supportive and successful district. People move there for the schools. My husband and I live in Shoreline because we wanted our children to go to school there and we wanted to teach where we live. You might think that we have it easy, yet every day I'm challenged. About one third of my 150 students have an IEP or a 504 plan. I have students on a safety plan for suicide prevention, students who are homeless, depressed, dealing with drug dependencies, who have life-threatening illnesses, ADD, Asperger's, and students with such high anxiety about life they make themselves ill. I work with students new to this country and students who read multiple grade levels below their peers. I'm in my classroom by seven in the morning. I'm lucky if I'm home by five. I grab something to eat and sit down to work for another two or three hours. Still, it's not enough. I wonder how I did this when my children were younger, but I did, and I still do, every day. Some people say, oh, you're a teacher. You get your summers off. My husband has three jobs. I have two. We both work all summer long to provide for our family. However, each morning as I head out the door, I don't say I'm going to work. I say I'm going to school. I learn as much from my students every day as I hope they learn from me. This isn't a job. It isn't a career. It's a passion. If this is your passion, then you have to read The Blueberry Story by Jamie Robert Vollmer, which reminds us that schools are not a business. We aren't dealing with numbers and products. We're working with human beings. To my own children, I know that we try to steer you away from teaching, but we need good teachers. We need the best for our schools. If you think this is your calling, then do it. Teaching is a lifetime passion 
that feeds you every day. Do it for the right reasons, for our children and our future. Am I a good teacher? I hope so. But I still have so much to learn, even after 25 years. Do I want to quit? Every day. But I don't. It's where I belong. So my name is Marquita Prinzi. I'm a fourth grade teacher in Seattle Public School District. And I work with the most amazing students that this world could offer. They represent the diversity of our city, particularly in the South End, and the spirit of the youth to be resilient through adversity. I also work at a great school with supportive staff and teachers and Principal is amazing. Many resources to support the students in the school. However, most days of the week, while I sit with my husband and baby, I take stock of how the week went in many days. I'm exhausted and dismayed at the challenges my students have to overcome in their lives, not including the challenges that our own systems create for them. At the end of the day, week, year, and summer before going on, I ask myself, am I a good teacher? What does that even mean? I reflect back on the sparkling times in my teaching career to help me answer those questions. At the beginning of my first year of teaching, having been hired a week before school started, I was already nervous at the task ahead of me, educating students to be thoughtful, ethical, socially responsible, and intelligent future adults. To make my anxiety worse, throughout the week before school started, various teachers, staffs, students, parents warned me of a particular student. She had a challenging life, raised by her grandmother while her father was in jail and mother was in rehab. She was academically behind and was labeled a bully. Many people were intimidated by her, possibly even scared. I hadn't even seen a picture of the student, let alone meet her. On the first day of school, Sierra walked in with the rest of the class looking for an uppercase letter on her desk that matched the lowercase letter on her index card, a strategy I learned from the first grade class I student taught in. She was wearing bright red boots. I introduced myself and she shyly replied. Then I told her that her boots were awesome and I liked the color. She smiled. No one mentioned her smile. It was in that moment that I started to wonder if there was something everyone missed about Sarah. Along with the many stories I was told at the beginning of the year, I was told that she lied easily and stole without remorse. I started counting and labeling every material that students could use in class. And once, I was missing one compass. The kind you draw circles with, with a pencil on one end and a sharp metal point on the other. I didn't want to think about what inappropriate thing a student might do with that. I asked the class where it went, and finally someone came forward. After dismissing the rest of the class, I listened to that student explain in tears how Sierra told her that she had to take the compass, otherwise Sierra was going to make everyone pick on her. I later confirmed that Sierra had the compass, but she didn't confess to any other wrongdoing. I had a heart to heart with her. I, I wasn't sure how much positive talk she had in her life, but if I based my prediction on what others told me at the beginning of the year, I could assume it wasn't much. I asked if she knew of any great leaders. She mentioned Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I asked her to describe what made him a good leader. He was confident. He voted others to stand up with him, and he didn't let hardships keep him down. I explained to her that there are all kinds of leaders in this world, and they don't all lead people to do good. Then I told her that I thought she was a leader. Because she was confident. She could motivate, or intimidate, others. And she hadn't let anything get in her way. However, she had to make some choices of which kind of leader she was going to be, working for good or working for bad. Throughout the year, whenever she was in doubt or in trouble, I simply asked her what type of leader did she want to be. Once, when she was talking to her friends during an assembly, I just looked at her and asked, good or bad? She turned back to her friends and asked them all to be quiet, and they respectfully listened to the rest of the assembly. That is when I knew what good teaching is. Someone who empowers others to be the best they can be and gives them access to the resources, skills, and emotional support needed for them to keep going forward, even when life tries to pull them back. Using all of these experiences from my past, I now see my students for who they are now and what type of leaders and advocates I knew they could and will be. Just like Sarah, they needed the tools of empowerment for them to see that they could be successful using their own unique personal traits and overcoming life's hardships. She's now much older and is still doing well. She has invited me to cheer her on at one of her upcoming roller derby games. This time, I hope she uses her 
intimidation skills for good. Don't worry about the name, I get it wrong all the time. I want to start by allowing you an opportunity to imagine something with me. So if you will indulge me, just close your eyes for a second. In this classroom, where you have now just walked in, maybe four feet off the ground, looking around you and seeing the number of students sitting in desks in a circle. You take a seat, but it's not in the circle where you're taking your seat, you're taking your seat outside. I want you to imagine another situation with me. This one, this one involves that anxious moment when you're on the edge of your seat, not because of anything happening at school, but what's gonna happen outside of school. This is the moment when you come home and you know that report card is in the mail. You heard what's in that report card. Your parents, maybe not. You walk to that mailbox, you take that official document with that letterhead and that return envelope and you bring it to your parents and you squinch. They open it and they read the following words. Below average. A nuisance. Remedial. A daydreamer. These are the words that a student like me at some point would have to experience with attention deficit disorder. When I was a student, that was in a time when attention deficit disorder had no name. If it did have one, it was not quite there yet in the mainstream. So it was replaced with the words I just shared. I think about those words and I think about what I'm supposed to be in response to that. And as future educators in this room, as educators, the number of us in this room who are educators at the moment, I want you to think about who you can be for that student. The one four feet off the ground, the one five feet off the ground, the one that happens to be taller than me, in most cases. What can you share with them to let them know that it's not the labels that define them, it's who they are. It's the possibilities. It's the opportunities. Taking those labels and turning them around. What could be a weakness could be a strength. I'll give you another imaginative situation. I was evaluated, and a psychologist handed me a cup. She then handed me a lid. It's hard to do with two hands. She asked me what to do with that. And as somebody who was in the room observed, they watched me take the cup, put it upside down, and place it on the lid. I want you to think of that as an opportunity, not as a setback, as a thinking in a different way, as opposed to someone who thinks 
and not the right way. You see the difference? That's, to me, where teaching begins. When you start thinking about the way to teach to that student, as opposed to making them someone they can't be. When I think about why I want to be a teacher, I think about how I can speak to that student. And there are any number of them in our classrooms every day of the year. And we know as teachers, and we were sharing these stories earlier, and you'll hear more of them, believe me, it is impossible, or if it's not impossible, certainly extremely difficult to justify the amount of work and time that kind of differentiation requires. But the weird thing about it is that I don't think about how impossible it is. I think about how I should keep trying at it. That's what I learned with attention deficit disorder. I learned that it's not impossible. It's the opportunity to keep trying. From turning failure into success, from turning the daydreamer into the imaginative person that kid can be, and probably is. That's the lesson I learned with attention deficit disorder. And I hope that if I could instill any hope in you, as teachers, it is that I don't want you to give up. You may not be paid enough for it. You may not have enough time in your day for it. But I don't want you to give up. Because for every one more student you can teach to, you can make that student think the impossible and make it possible. Thanks. I have a student named Johnny. Johnny does well in school. Johnny completes his homework on time. Johnny is a good football player. My student Johnny has a dream. It's a dream many of us share, the American dream. He dreams of a family, a house, a car, the world is his oyster, and Johnny is not afraid to dream big. But the problem is, my student's name isn't really Johnny. It's Amari. Amari's homework is sometimes missing. He has to sit in the back of the room or by his window seat. Even though he has meaningful things to say, in our honors English class, he rarely raises his hand. When Amari's group is asked to present, he shrinks away, trying to make himself invisible. But when he does present, he blows us away. One day, Amari came to get help on an essay after school. I noticed the name Johnny was written at the top of his paper. When I asked him why, Amari sighed, Johnny is everything I'm not. He explained that Johnny motivates himself to do his homework, get good grades, try harder on the football field. He told me he has dreams at night, literal dreams where he visualizes Johnny's success. When I asked, why do you need to call yourself Johnny? Why can't Amari be successful? He froze. He, he said, I don't know. I mean, you wouldn't expect someone named Johnny to look like me. Perhaps our African American students subconsciously know the results of a study entitled, Are Emily and Greg More Employable Than Lakeisha and Jamal? It highlights discrimination in job applications. Applicants with African American sounding names got 50% fewer callbacks to jobs than those with white sounding names. Maybe this is why Johnny's friends, Jack and Ed, are really Kendrick and DeAndre. They talk in exaggerated, elevated, academic voices with gusto. They do this for comedic effect, but there is a grain of truth in their joking. By performing white, they push back against this pressure to bracket who they are. 
But Amari has taken his performance to a whole new level and convinced himself that being Johnny will allow him to achieve his dreams. Society's problems seem to be mirrored in the microcosm of high school classrooms. We work to empower students, the next generation, to think critically about how to change society. But what if it's too late? What if they've already internalized the need to create what they deem a socially acceptable alter ego from a privileged background to motivate themselves to be successful? I feel like I've been failing Amari. We've been failing Amari. Still, teachers are tasked with getting students to believe in themselves in a society that might not believe in them. It doesn't help that we as teachers often don't reflect the diverse backgrounds of our students. So much of teaching happens in between lessons. So much is about the relationships you develop with students. This isn't something a textbook or standardized test can teach. This perhaps is why I'm a teacher, and it's been a privilege being Amari's teacher. Now, at least in my class, Amari's name appears on all of his papers, even sometimes your boy Amari. <laughs> but I still hear Johnny surface from time to time. That afternoon, though, helping Amari with his essay, I shared my dream with him. I said, I hope one day you don't need Johnny to be successful. I hope one day you believe Amari can be successful. Thank you. I taught a spoken word summer camp last July. And then I was thrilled um, when an unexpected crew of 7 to 12 graders actually signed up to write poems with me in the middle of their summer break. This was kind of an organic progression for me. Uh, as a humanities teacher at international school, I tell the kids right from the first day of school that we're all gonna be performers this year. It totally breaks them out. But, um, and I tell them it's okay, because we're all just gonna practice being brave over and over again until we actually become brave. And we do, every single year. And this is why I teach. So Slam Camp was such a great opportunity for me because I got to do kind of like an accelerated version of my year-long classroom, but in a week. So um, we had to build our community really fast, which was an interesting challenge because I had kids in there from like little kids, like an 11-year-old boy who was really obsessed with lacrosse and superheroes, all the way up to young adults who were learning how to drive and falling in love. So we started off really safe. On Monday, we were doing things like reciting Black Delicious lyrics and acting out the lyrics to the song, uh, the Whole Foods parking lot song. But then by Thursday, we were ready to have bigger conversations and we were having conversations about what other kind of performances we're doing in our lives, like gender, like being cool. By Friday, we were ready to talk about anger. That was okay, because we had created the safe space where we could do that, where we could take that risk. It was on that Friday that one of my students, a pretty and popular 15-year-old girl, got up and took the microphone and blew us all away. From the first line in her poem, she had the room totally stunned, totally silent. And she cried right from the beginning. And then she cried all the way through. She ranted against Seventeen magazine. She spat back against that horrible quote that nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. She told us that her friends didn't seem to love themselves the way that they loved each other. She said her poem was for every cookie that they wouldn't eat. By the end of that poem, she was still crying, but her voice was loud and clear. She had her shoulders back. She had her hair pulled back away from her beautiful, wet face, and her feet were planted on the floor. By the end of that poem, she was triumphant. She was celebrating her 15-year-old body in all of its curves. For the thigh gap, she didn't need and that poem echoed like a rally call through the microphone and filled up our classroom 
and by the time she was done, her face still red and wet, the room was still totally silent. The room was still totally stunned. And then all at once, we stood up and we started to clap and clap and clap and then cheer and then cry. She had all of us crying right along with her and hugging and cheering. And then that boy, the 11 year old boy gets up, turns to all of us in the audience ecstatic and says to us, that was the most amazing thing I have ever seen. And we're like, dude, you're 11. <laughs> But it was, it was. It was the most amazing thing actually all of us had ever seen. And we were crying and cheering with her because we were celebrating her bravery, obviously. We were celebrating the empathy that she had created in that classroom that day. But we were also celebrating her willingness to totally disregard whether or not we were ready as her audience for what she was ready to tell us. And in fact, we had worked up to that Friday. We were ready for what she had to tell us. I checked in with that student yesterday as I prepared for this talk, and I thanked her for allowing me to share this story with you guys tonight. She told me that her favorite thing about slam camp was also her favorite thing about our humanities class together. I had her as a seventh grader and also as an eighth grader. She said, you ask us to do things that scare us all the time. And I realized that's why I teach. And that's why I'm here tonight, at the University of Washington, pretending like I'm brave too, practicing what I teach. I'm Kristen Leong, and that's why I teach. Thank you.